and we are recording on Zoom. And now, try to start recording on QuickTime Player. But it always seems to be a little bit of a headache. There we go. And now I think we're golden. I think we're recording now. We are episode 392. This, my friends, is a solo rant. What is a solo rant? You know what? Fuck you. Uh, solo rants where I just start talking. And there's no uh, rhyme or reason for it. And um, new merch, Snoop Loops. Go buy it. I'll put it in the uh, description. Sticky it in the top comment. Snoop Loops. It's got a Fruit Loops and Snoop Dogg superimposed on some Fruit Loops. It's brilliant, I know. Um, a solo rant for all the new listeners is where I just start talking. Uh, I don't have a guest. It's just me. And uh, some solo rants are there's a topic, like maybe about aircraft carriers or the CIA or whatever, World War One. Um, but there, most solo rants, there is no topic. It's just we're just we're just going for a walk. We're going for a verbal walk, and we see where it goes and where it stops. Nobody knows. Um, they might not be for you. If you like a definitive episode, I would go watch one of the other 390. But for Solar Ants, they're a little more out there. They're a little more going to wing it. Just going to fucking wing it. Um, so, that being said, it, uh, it seems like uh, the Biden administration is actually being tough on China, which... I'll give credit where credit's due. I didn't, I didn't see that coming. That was very much of the, the Manchurian candidate mindset. But um, it seems like the Biden administration is being tough on China. And fuck it, you know, like, like I just said, give credit where credit's due. That's awesome. I hope they push further. I hope we build up our navy more, and uh, I hope we start meeting China on every front throughout the world economically. Economically, is that the right word? Financially, diplomatically, academically, chemically, biologically, nuclearly, weapons, space. I think Space Force is what we're going to need to develop more. Not that I know what the fuck I'm talking about. I'm sitting here in a Fruit Loops hoodie. I mean, truly, like there can be more of a, a, a jackass that doesn't know what he's talking about. But I'm going to keep talking about it. So go fuck yourself. Um, I think Space Force would have to be the way to go, right? I think you'd have to push it further. Man, if there's not some... Man, if there's something so... There's something so... um, Oddly attractive about ICBMs tipped with thermonuclear weapons. I mean, just as a weapon system, I mean, it truly, it, it, there is nothing above it. I mean, let's, and this is off the top of my head, so I'm probably going to, a lot of it's going to be exaggerated and bullshit, but let's take, a, let's just go with the, let's go in this, let's look at back at the 60s, maybe 50s, 60s, right? We'll look at a Command and Control by Eric M. Schlosser. We can look at a bunkers in Arkansas, not bunkers, no, um, silos in Arkansas, the Damascus incident. But let's look at why LeMay loved those Titan II missiles, right? Because they had a big old nine megaton, nine megatons on the top. Later with the introduction of MIRVs, M-I-R-V, multiple, multiple independently targeted re-entry vehicles. And for the longest time, I always thought a MIRV was like a shotgun where the ICBM would go up at arc and then let's say like it's 80 miles over New York when it's coming down as opposed to one that can be shot down. What you would do is you'd shoot like 10. And so maybe you'd hit each borough. Then you'd also hit lower midtown, maybe central park right in Yankee stadium. Right. And the idea was, although it was massive overkill, it's that you couldn't stop it. I did not know probably until last year, 2020, great year right um that they were 
independently uh, targetable. So you would, you know, at its apex, maybe, and I don't know how independently targetable they are, but I think it's somewhere like, you know, you could hit like New York, Boston, Baltimore, DC with each one, like one MERV. So it's, you know, I don't know if maybe you could hit New York and LA. I have no idea. I don't know anything about the trajectories or when they open up or where the sort of scatter happens. Um, obviously, you put in decoys, balloons, um, because zero, when there's no air resistance, they all travel at the same speed. Um, man, I love when I'm when I when I'm fatter. My face just looks rounder. It's so gross. It's so gross. It's just so gross talking about just overweight as I'm just nonchalantly talking about thermonuclear Armageddon. Just, uh, just a little bit around. Just a little cheeks. Cheeks are a little around. Um, but uh, yeah, so I didn't realize that they were independently targetable. But let's let's just look at that, right? Let's just... So you can shoot instead of the one nine megaton because I think that was the biggest... Um, I think that was the biggest production warhead the United States produced. Um, we did Castle Bravo, which was 25 mega, or sorry, 15 megatons. It was meant to be six. I don't know what the actual, the largest H bomb the United States ever detonated was. I think the largest production was the nine megaton, meaning it was, you know, it wasn't a, a, a one and out. Um, biggest hydrogen bomb. Um, yeah, America, excuse me, that is not, that's not America, this is our bomba. Uh, the B-53 was a high-yield bunker, but Jesus Christ, the MK B-53 was a high-yield bunker buster thermonuclear weapon <laughs> developed, I mean, can you, hey, I was right, oh, this is it, deployed on the Strategic Air Command bombers, Lome, one point for Tommy, the B-53, with a yield of nine megatons, was the most powerful weapon of the U.S. arsenal after the last of the B-41. Well, what's the B-41? The B-41. <laughs> <laughs> 25 megatons. Jesus Christ. Fucking hell. Service life. About 500. They made 500. Jesus. They were retired in July 76. They were progressively phased out starting in 1963 with the B-53, which is the one which talked about. Oh, my God. 25 megatons. <laughs> it's just... I never knew that. I never knew that. Hmm. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Man, so, so like, we, I, Tsar Bomba was 50, right? I think it's closer to 58 was the, uh, the actual yield. And it's, it's obviously everyone knows it was, it was, it was, uh, capable of 100 megatons. But that's pretty crazy that we had production yield 25. So half the size of Tsar Bomba, but we like mass produced them. Tsar Bomba was like a, Tsar Bomba was like a, a one in, you know, it's like, um, it's like the world's longest 18 wheeler. There's this 18 wheeler and it goes on like tours throughout the United States, but it's like its only purpose is being the world's longest 18 wheeler. It's got like a huge cab and it has, it's, it's, I think it's called big red or something. I mean, it's cool, but it's like, it has no, it has no purpose. It's like, there's not a fleet of them on the highways delivering goods to Costco, right? It's, there's one of them and its purpose is being the biggest 18 wheeler. Like it's a closed loop. That's what it does. It drives around towns really. I mean, that's a fucking, I don't know what town you're living in. If that's the, if that's the attraction, you know what? That's not cool. I'm not trying to shit on small towns where that's a cool thing because I would absolutely go see the world's biggest 18 wheeler. I apologize. Not really. Go fuck yourself. That's crazy though. A twenty-five, me yeah. So the Zar Bomba was kind of more like, it was more like the like Big Red. It was like, it's like a freak show. Like it wasn't mass produced. They couldn't put it on a missile. It was too heavy. The whole reason they scaled it down was because they were scared that the um the 
the Tupelo T. I can never say that name. The the, the aircraft company or division. I don't know if the Soviet Union had companies. T U P O L E V Tupolev. Tupolev. Um, it was stripped of a bunch of excessive shit. Excessive. It was stripped of everything that it really. As long as it could still take off and land, they took out everything else, and uh, they put the Zar. It, I don't even know if it had the Zar bomb on the inside. I think it maybe carried it. But they were nervous that um that they were nervous that it the the pilots w- wouldn't be able to get away even with a parachute on it, um which I think is horseshit because that just not not to say that's not not a legitimate concern it is because the fifty or fifty eight megaton bomb still greatly damaged the aircraft when it was miles away. I mean, I mean the first um not not Castle Bravo but Ivy Mike when we first detonated Ivy Mike. Um, I want to say in like 51 or 53, wherever the uh, Ron, Ronjalap. Man, I need to get like a septum surgery. I can't breathe. It's just a just a, a little side note. I can't I can't respirate as a carbon based life form that uses the electron transport chain. I can't respirate. This water isn't wet, but it was Ivy Mike, I think. Um, where it was like the surface of the the, the planes because they they do t- the, the thermonuclear detonations or atomic detonations are incredibly interesting. If you go and look at not just the whole, it's a huge bomb. The amount of of tests they they would set up around these, not just hey, let's put a boat in the water and see how much it damages. No, but I mean, I mean all sorts of shit. You I mean like bringing in non-native plants and planting them. And seeing how it affects different things, putting on different uh, different additives and paint, and building a whole fake town, Tim Dillon fake business, putting a whole fake town with different paints to see which one uh, um, uh, reflected the thermal pulse better, so it didn't burn off. Um, and with the first hydrogen bomb, IV Mike, what they did was they uh, they built this tube. It was like a two or three mile long tube. And it was named after the scientist that produced it. I don't remember. But if it was Smith, it would be the Smith tube. It would, nothing really interesting. But it went for several miles out. And it was like a wooden, it was like a wooden hallway, like a couple miles long, just a wooden hall. What a weird thing. If it's the 1950s and you're just you're just working for Uncle Sam, you gotta go get on a boat. You gotta sail for three weeks out into the middle of nowhere in the Pacific and you've got enough lumber to build a fucking, I don't know, insert joke. You build a three mile long tunnel between islands. I mean, it's just like, I just work here, man. I just, I just, I just nail this stuff together. But there was several mile long, the Smith tunnel, whatever it was called. And, um, it was more like a hallway and inside of it was um, thousands and thousands and thousands of balloons, just big, you know, a balloon, a, 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 just enough to sort of fill the cross space. So uh, obviously it can't be a square, but, you know, if it's a square tunnel, you'd have these balloons as much as you could fill up. And then they just lined them. And so, uh, so what they wanted to do was I think they put helium in the balloons. I don't think it was hydrogen. I think it was helium. And they filled all these balloons with helium. Was it helium? It maybe it may have been hydrogen. It was something weird. And the balloons were like super thin, like the thinnest they could be without breaking or popping. And they line and they lined them all up. Man, that's the because isn't it isn't it uh, demolition ranch? He he like line up balloons and shoot them with a fifty cal. This was the original demolition ranch. You know, instead of like, we're going to light up 50 balloons and shoot them with a 50 gal. They lined up like 12,000 and shot it with the x-ray pulse of a thermonuclear warhead. <laughs> like, fucking Christ. It's the original jackass. Um, but they filled up these balloons because what they wanted to simulate was they wanted to get the original, the first light signature coming from the bomb. And they wanted it, for whatever reason, they didn't want it distorted by, like, Earth atmosphere. They wanted it as if it was going through a hydrogen or a helium atmosphere. 
but instead of trying to make an airtight tunnel, whereas one leak could fuck it all up, just, you know, different gradients, instead of trying to make an airtight tunnel and filling it all with helium or hydrogen, and then, you know, one wrong thing, because you're out in the middle of the Pacific, you know, I don't know if you have like a team of expert welders who can make an airtight capsule three miles long. Instead of doing that, it was, a, uh, it was, you know, they decrease, I guess, you it's actually increasing the number of failure points, but not really. Because one of these balloons can pop and it's probably gonna have really no effect. You could probably lose a you could probably lose a thousand of them as long as you still have the other eleven thousand. But the idea was they had this long wooden tunnel filled with like helium or hydrogen, whatever it was. They had all these balloons. And that simulated you know, I get, it's almost like, you know, I guess going through a vacuum, but they didn't want it to be a vacuum. They, for whatever reason, they wanted that element. I have no idea why I don't work for Los Alamos uh, or Livermore. So they filled up this whole thing. They filled up this whole thing and they wanted that first light signature coming out on the other side. Now, mind you, Ivy Mike demolished everything for tens of miles this wasn't an atomic bomb not that those are anything to scoff at this was the first hydrogen bomb thermonuclear weapon that deuterium burn right richard m rhodes a breath of tritium tragically solomonic which is his best quote tragically solomonic talks about how like the actual elements the ingredients if you will of ivy mike were actually like the same precious metals that you'd use to build like a temple to the gods, like platinum, palladium, gold, silver. Um, but uh, so they wanted that first pulse of light to go through the whole thing, all right? And they wanted, and they, and then on the other side of it, they put all these weird, um, I think they called them exotic elements, but they're not, I mean, they are but they aren't it was like xanthanum um uh, tantalum tantalum t-a-n-t-u-l-u-m um all these kind of kind of the weirder ones maybe you don't see a lot and they put those on the other side and they wanted that first pulse of light to go through all those balloons and hit those you know what i think that was a money laundering scheme <laughs> They probably figured that whoever was looking into them, I just spit. That was gross. They probably thought, yeah, well, never mind. It's probably a money laundering scheme. They thought whoever would have looked into it would have probably gotten about as far as I did. And I, I at least have a biology degree with, I took some chemistry classes. They were probably relying on the average Joe who didn't grow up with YouTube or Google, the average Joe and like the, you know, the government accountability office is probably going to look at that if they could even look at it because it was all top secret special access programs. They were probably going to look at it and be like, of course, the, we need the, the tantrum and the xanthanum and the. This was a money laundering scheme. <laughs> That's what this was. We need uh, we need uh, we need uh, we need an entire aircraft carrier full of um, what should we put a uh, timber timber to build um, um, a tunnel with with balloons. We need balloons with um, helium. On the other side is um, uh, the tantalum, uh, xanthanum, um, you know, unobtainium, um, vibranium. It was a money laundering scheme. Those bastards. Man, almost 70 years, you could have gotten away with it, too, if it wasn't for that meddling artist with a podcast. That was a goddamn money laundering scheme. <laughs> but, um... Motherfuckers. But, yeah, so the original pulse on that thing, though, the heat pulse. So they have all these... They have all these boats, all these... Just, I mean, they're so... It's easy to look at them and be like, they were just blowing up nukes. The amount of te the amount of equipment and sensors and uh, staging for these things was uh, mind boggling. Not only that, they did it all top secret as well. And then not only that, you got to think hydrogen bombs. The explosions are so big, you can't do them out in Nevada. You can't do a hydrogen bomb over the U.S. You, the shockwave will destroy cities 100 miles away. 
that might be a little bit of an exaggeration, but you had to do them out in the middle of nowhere, uh, uh, Bikini. Well, I think that's where Crossroads was, or maybe Baker. But there's a uh, like Ronjalap, uh, Quadraline. Um, I think we maybe did some out at sea as well, Point Nemo. I know that's where we crashed spacecraft. Um, man, yeah, it's a gay little swoop I got with my hair coming up. Looks like a geisha fan. I, I never in a million years would have guessed that Orientals were highly, uh, highly offensive people. I, ne- I never in a million years actually shave a BMW. But um, yeah, so the amount of tests they, the, the amount of things they would do surrounding these hydrogen bombs was just absolutely insane. Um, yeah, it's just bad shit, absolutely bad shit. And one of the things that, that they had these um, I know they had like sniffer, uh, they had these they had these drones that they would fly, but I think those might have been the. A bomb tests and maybe not, maybe not the H bomb tests. I believe this was out in Nevada, where they would fly through the mushroom, <laughs> fly through the fucking mush. Obviously, obviously after it turned from a big ball of fire, but they'd fly them through the mushroom cloud to pick up. Uh, I think they picked up like drafts. They wanted to know you know what the weather was like, the wind, but they also wanted radioactivity. Um, and then I guess like. I guess secondary and tertiary uh, metabolites, if you will, metabolites of the the organism being the explosion. But yeah, the point of all of that is is they had these planes, who I mean, amongst all the other planes they were using, some of them were just there to measure heat. That even those were at like different concentric cir- circles, going out tens of miles, and one of them. And I could be butchering this, so let's let's just go on the conservative side, because although I think the actual facts are like batshit insane, I don't want to accidentally guess higher and make, take it. Why the fuck do I care? I think they're like fifty miles out. Let's just say they're twenty, just because it's not as sexy as fifty. They're like twenty miles out, twenty miles from Ground Zero, at the hypo center, and when the bomb went off instantaneously the surface of the 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 skin of the fuselage the 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 outside of the plane instantly rose by like 80 or 90 degrees fahrenheit instantly it's insane so back to our bomba we know that absolutely the the plane would have probably been completely destroyed Right, so Ivy Mike, I think Ivy Mike was like five or seven megatons. I don't remember, but yeah, fifty-eight megaton. It absolutely, I mean, at the very least, the thermal pulse would have damaged the plane. But they were concerned about it being, and it was, it was more than that. It was also like, I mean, I think, I think there was actually some like severe structural damage. But it's weird because that doesn't sound like a Soviet thing to give a fuck about the pilots. To me, I think they were concerned with something happening with the 100 megaton bomb. I think they were concerned that the radioactivity was going to blow back on the Soviet Union. I don't know. Maybe they thought we were going like, to they were going to punch a hole through the stratosphere. You know, some space ball shit, suck all the air out. I don't think that the reason they did what they did was because they were concerned for the lives of the pilots. That just doesn't time and time again, history shows that that is not a concern of the Soviets. Who knows? Maybe I'm just a uh, just a blue eyed, white skinned American who's still you know stuck in the '50s, calling the commies the bad guys. That might be it too. Who knows? Yeah, so it could have been a hundred. That's crazy. But yeah, so thermonuclear, just the most advanced. I don't really want to talk about ice. It, so, but it's crazy thinking that we put all these on top of a warhead that's in a nuclear hardened silo that can launch get up to Mach 23, split apart, those come in, you can't stop them, the shotgun approach, they come in, they detonate, multi-megatons, the thermal pulse burns everything, the shockwave destroys everything. So immediately you have the thermal pulse, which just burns everything. After you have the shockwave, which physically blows it all over. They create their own self-sustaining firestorms. 
There's an EMP instantaneously as well that destroys all electronics at the speed of light. And then there's radioactivity that kills everyone and it turns all the surrounding shit into a denied area, meaning it's too, it's too radioactive for you to go on or to stay in. I mean, is there more of an insane weapon? It launches from your own backyard. You don't got. You can bring your bomber over or your submarines, but not even. You can just shoot them from the Great Plains. You can shoot them from the Great Plains. They exist in a nuclear hardened silo that can't be destroyed by nuclear weapons. They're in the Great Plains. You shoot them. They go to your enemy on the other side of the planet. The SR-71 Mach 3. Everybody knows the SR-71 flyby. The ground speed story. Uh, you know, this is us at Cessna. Blah, blah. Fuck Mach 3. Mach 23. The, 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 the Aurora, right? The, the hypersonic spy plane that supposedly existed in the 80s. So that one, Mach 5. The Lockheed Martin Skunk Works announced in November 2013 uh, the SR-72, the successor, and they said it was going to go twice as fast. So... Mach 6, or if it's for using uh, Brian Schul's metrics uh, pilot of the SR-71, you could say maybe it's going Mach 7. Let's say Mach 7. Fuck it, let's say Mach 12. It's still only half as fast as an ICBM. So you launch it. It's in a nuclear-hardened silo. It's in your backyard. You launch it. It goes at Mach 23. It goes to space. It can reach anywhere in the world in about a half hour. It comes down at a near vertical trajectory. You can shoot them as a shotgun. They explode in the sky. Multi-megatons, megatons. A thermal pulse that lights everything on fire. An EMP that destroys all electronics. Doesn't turn them off, destroys them. They're fried, they're finished, they're recycled. A shockwave that demolishes everything. And radioactivity that makes it so the area cannot be occupied. I mean, is there anything? I, I just don't know how you can... How do you top that? From the safety of your backyard. Mach 23, vertical trajectory from space. EMP, thermal, radiation, shockwave. I, there is no... I, what greater weapon is there? Oh, this new cruise missile? Fuck off. Well, hypersonic... We have hypersonics. They're called ICBMs. Now I get it. They, you, their trajectories are set and you can see where they're going. But man, that's insane. That is absolutely batshit insane. Yeah, I, I don't know how you how you how you top that, how you beat that. And as insane and as evil as they are, they work. We have not had total war since August August ninth, nineteen forty five. We've had vicious wars, sure, Korea, Vietnam, Middle East. We've had vicious wars. But we haven't had a total war. Where they... Like, the only reason an A-bomb wasn't used earlier was because no one had one in World War II. And the entire nations were throwing themselves at this. Everything was for the war effort. Everything. Just cranking out bombers and ships and subs and tanks and, and machine guns and, and just throwing men into the meat grinder. As soon as you had a new technology, V2 rocket, start using it. The jet engine, the, the ME262 Messerschmitt, start using it. The only reason they didn't use an A-bomb earlier is because they didn't have one. Which is crazy. So, in that sense, thermonuclear weapons have worked. They've prevented total war. And they've worked in a in a in a, a terrifying way. They've worked in an, an evil way. They're so bad that there's no winning. 
And it doesn't mean that you can't kill your enemy. It means that you won't survive as well. You can absolutely kill your enemy. The Soviet Union could absolutely kill. They could they could irrevocably destroy the United States within 30 minutes. It's 4.43, Friday, March 19th, 2020, or 2021, 4.43 p.m. 75% plus of the entire United States population could be dead by f- could be dead by 5:13 p.m. if the Soviets the the Russians the Chicoms if they wanted to there's no da- there's no doubt about that I mean we'd shoot down some but I mean it doesn't it doesn't matter if I throw 10 darts at you full of poison you can stop eight of them but if each dart has the ability to kill an elephant, I mean, it doesn't matter. I can throw 100 at you. You can stop 95 of them. It doesn't matter. Yeah. The only way is the very thing that makes them so lethal. I throw 100 darts at you. Even if you stop 95 of them, the only thing that's stopping me is not the... You know, the idea that maybe you're going to stop a hundred of my darts. It's that I know that same thing is coming at me. Because the time in between me throwing the darts and them hitting you or you stopping them is enough time for you to throw your 100 darts at me. Like one big bundle. Um, Not like a hundred individual darts, but like you pick up a hundred and throw them. So that's insane. That's absolutely insane. Yeah, the only way they can they can be stopped is with that. It, it's their lethality is what stops them, because whatever I'm throwing at you, it's coming back to me. So I can pick up a bundle of a hundred of them, throw them at you, and you're gonna throw your one hundred at me. And I know that I can stop ninety eight of them on a on, on my best possible day. Doesn't matter if one of those darts hits me. We'll just say it has VX gas in it. Done. You're dead. I mean, is that what is ensuring peace? This whole idea of, of you know, of getting rid of nukes. I mean, I know Reagan was really behind that. He really, Reagan truly believed that there could be a nuclear-free world. And I know he and Gorbachev at the Reykjavik uh, summit tried. But uh, Reagan wanted to keep SDI. Gorbachev wanted only in-lab testing. Reagan was adamant not to do that. And so the whole thing fell through. But, I mean, can it be done? Is there a purpose to a nuclear-free world? If no one has nukes, is someone going to get a little uppity and maybe go try to demolish Beijing or New York, knowing that a conventional war is on the horizon that they might be able to win, just like every other conventional war? I think knowing that thermonuclear death coming in at Mach 23 with an EMP, a thermal EMP pulse, a thermal pulse, a shock wave and radiation is coming back to you. And even if you survive that, you go get in a bunker. I mean, what are you surviving? For what world? What world do you continue to live in? It's no, it, what, what is it worth? So do it's I I I now, and I believe it was a U.S. I forget who. It might have been Truman. I don't remember. Maybe it was Oppenheimer, but they said something like, um, "The arms race doesn't make any sense because our sixty, our sixtieth, our sixty thousandth, I can't speak, our sixty thousandth nuclear warhead." isn't going to make us any safer than our 600th. Like you want enough to guarantee that you can destroy the enemy and probably the world. But after that, you're, you're, there's no point. I really got to pee. 
35 minutes. <sighs> Took a nice bathroom break. Yeah, so... Now... Obviously, you don't want any nuclear weapons. I mean... I mean, obviously, yeah. I mean, I, I wish there was no such thing as disease. I wish we all lived to 120 with healthy lives and we were all best friends and we took mushrooms and just had orgies all day and floated in bliss and made it planet pleasure. I mean, who doesn't want that? But seeing as how we have to pull our heads out of our asses and look at it, it's a, it's a brutal, disgusting world. We are We are apes. We are the warring apes. We kill each other. I mean, what is it in, in was it like that like Chinese, I don't know, I'm butchering this. There's some warrior from China. And it was like, if you have a bunch of monkeys in cages and they're just going nuts and they're not behaving no matter what you do, bring a chicken into the room or bring a monkey into the room and chop its fucking head off and let the stump bleed out. They'll all behave. How do you get, how do you get humans to behave? Humans that have done World War One and World War Two, humans that have done the Holocaust, the Holodomor, the the mass starvation in China, the Great Leap Forward, uh, Stalin's breadbasket in Ukraine. How do you that that have ens that enslaved their own people for four hundred years? That will throw human suffering at a pile of rocks until it forms a pyramid. I mean, marrying away girls when they're 11. Like, how do you, how do you stop that? How do you keep those people in line? How do you keep, you know, uh, how do you keep boisterous Americans? How do you keep cartels? How do you keep uh, uh, Nazis who call uh, non-Germans untermenschen? who would teach lessons about the Jew and they would they would and they would talk of them as if they were a different species. They would say much like and there I mean there are there are fucking reports of German scientists who they'd be like, you know, much like us, you know, they have two eyes, they have a mouth. They actually even have similar parts of their own brain. They have opposable they talk about them like they're fucking you know, like I like we would talk about an ape. Be like, yeah, you know, it's very similar structure, same kind of collarbone and it can move around. But that's how they would talk about people of, that's how they would talk about blacks, homosexuals, gypsies, Jews. They even have their own languages. They metabolize food just like us. That's what these people thought. That's what these fucking Nazis thought. So how do you keep those or, or, or Japanese kamikazes or Americans willing to drop nuclear bombs on people? Miley Massacre or Kent State or Napalm and Agent Orange and it's, it's kind of like when Ultron becomes self-aware in Avengers and it shows the whole, it's like, what, you know, it's like, what is my purpose? And it's, why am I talking like that? What is my purpose? Nixon, um, Sean Connery. No, he's like going through, he's like, what is my, and he's like world peace, peace in our time. And he's like, it can't be done. There's too much. And it shows the, the montage of like, you know, 10 frames a second of just explosions and war and just, it shows like you know it shows like the mushroom cloud over hiroshima it shows like the girl walking in vietnam with like her skin melted off it shows tiananmen square and it shows riots and, ta -ta -ta and like global warming and pollution and 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 factory farming and it, sh and it ends with like tony stark with the the jericho missile exploding behind him and he's like it can't be done how do you how do you fight that how do you keep that at bay thermonuclear Armageddon the fear that it that that's what you get it truly is hmm I've talked about this before where uh, one time in college I was meditating that's pretty high actually and I, and I tried to break down reality into its constituent pieces in my mind and what I came down to was that there are two aspects of reality. There's the physical, the corporeal, the the stuff, you know, things. And there is the entity, the self, the I, the consciousness experiencing it. 
So there is material and there's that which experiences the material. There's just matter bumping into each other, obeying the laws of physics and driven by the four fundamental forces. And there is that which experiences it. So how do we break that down into, into we have consciousness and the corporeal. The physical shit and I, not necessarily humans, not necessarily carbon-based life forms, self-awareness. The fact that I am, right now I am, you're listening to this, you are. There's something going on. There isn't nothing. There is. And what I wanted to explain, or and or I guess discover while I was meditating, was you know so what are these like common threads, right? You know it's like it's like Joseph Campbell's the hero's the hero's journey, right? Every story, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, series of unfortunate events, Star Wars, Hercules, what they they all basically follow the same general pattern, right? The call to adventure, and you know the belly of the whale, or the ultimate boon, the apotheosis, atonement with the father, duality. There's like seventeen stages, but every story follows the hero's journey, right? So we have that. You know, every every sports movie, right? You have the bad team, the mighty ducks, right? It's the other team. They're from Iceland. They wear all black, right? You have the unlikely hero. They start to do well, and they're the ragtag, you know, whatever. And then there's a setback. There's always a setback. And then they somehow get back together for the big game. Someone always shows up in the stands to watch. You know, Dad, you came. I wouldn't miss it for the world, son. They always get new uniforms. They always get new uniforms. Uh, the girl is there. Yeah, right? <laughs> right? And then there's always a mentor, a mentor, who comes and is like, I want you to, I want you to wear, here's my lucky baseball card. I used to put it, you know, I used to put it in my pocket while I played. Thanks, Gramps. Yeah, no, no, thank you, son. Right? It's always something like that. All right? And the, yeah, that, and right, so there's always these tropes, Right? Yeah. And then the game always goes back and forth, right? And then there's even like a microcosm. There's always a setback within the game where it seems like all is lost, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know how it goes. You know how it goes. Yeah, he gets the girl, blah, 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 blah. So I tried to kind of look for like the tropes, the stereotypes, the, the archetypes, the caricatures of these two divisions so just like the hero's journey you can apply it to every story right lord of the you know frodo or harry potter or, or luke skywalker you can really see it in all of them i tried to see what are the the the, the tropes of the physical world so we have we have chemistry, we have biochemistry, we have molecular biology, we have physics, we have mathematics, we have, um, I guess heat is physics, we have biology, we have genetics, or what's in biology, right? But you get the point, right? I have all these different studies, geology, climatology, astronomy, astrophysics, nuclear physics, whatever, right? what is the the primary law behind all of them i mean they're not all applicable you know when we're talking about the division rates of cells in a new organism in mitosis or meiosis or whatever versus the uh, patterns of sediment deposition in in geologic time i mean they're not comparable right I mean, the ones over the course of a couple of hours, how many times does this thing double versus, you know, it might take a hundred million years for the continent to shift. So what, what are the, what are the underlying themes? And to me, what, what I, what I 
concluded was that it's very much so you, I mean, I'm sure you you can probably think of if you think about it yourself, you'll probably come up with the same answer. But if you don't want to think about it, we can man, look at this little flap of hair. It's really it's you know, it's, it's the fuck is that? Um I just need to just cut it off. Just cut it the fuck off. My hair looks like Lego hair when I put gel on it. It looks like it can just pop off. Mike Pence has Lego hair. You could remove his hair. I sw- fucking someone's going to kill him and it's going to somehow come back to me. And my defense is there. So you by removing hair, you meant removing the head. God damn it. No. Sorry, I was all jacked up on Snoop Loops. But the the underlying theme is that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? I mean, you you knew that, right? It's, the, you know, the seesaw, you know, the swing, you push it and it comes back. You know, the tide goes in, tide goes out. And nobody knows, right? Bill O'Reilly, right? What goes up must come down, right? Um, it all dies in the fall and it, it, it grows in the spring, right? It, it's, right, the fucking, the, the, the lion eats the deer and the and the lion dies and the lion dissolves and the lion's eaten by the hyenas. The carcass is eaten by the hyenas and the hyena is shit and the shit goes into the soil and the soil, you know, grows plants and, you know, those get deposited and whatever the soil gets deposited into the river and the river goes out into the ocean and it chain and it's nutrients in the ocean and the plankton eat the nutrients and the fish eat the plankton and the fucking, the birds eat the fish and then the, the, I don't know the, I guess deer are carnivore. Who cares? Just say the fucking whatever eats the bird, and then the lion eats the 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 deer. What it, it's just it's the circle of life, right? Mufasa, uh, Scar, um, again, hero's journey. It's all there's this. It's a closed loop, right? I mean, normal force with gravity, right? It's it's all it's it's conserved, right? And then there was some debate for a while that this life violate uh some of the laws of thermodynamics and it's no because although it's increasingly complex as opposed to increasingly disordered it is offset by its creation of heat so there's this underlying theme right equal and opposite reaction very good what's the other half of reality the consciousness, right? So we have the the physical thing, right? All the within our multiverse, or within our universe, in the multiverse that we know of. The other side is the experiencer. Well, that's uh, and that's and mind you, it's so we're not neurology doesn't you know or that doesn't fall into the consciousness that falls into the physical because it's physical matter, it's neurons, it's glia, glia, and axons and dendritic growths and all that shit, action potentials, calcium sarcoplasmic reticulums, action impulses, just the mind itself, right? Any biology around it, the skull, the your cerebrospinal fluid, that's all falls within the physical bifurcation of reality. We're looking at the consciousness, okay? So there's no set science. Any set science you can you can you can name for this, I think, has to be automatically pushed into the physical world because there are no set sciences for the mind. If you're talking about the infrastructure, the physiology of it, that stays in the the physical world. But within the mind, my dog was uh, like blind towards the end of his life. And sometimes you'd go to pet him and he couldn't see your hand. So you'd start, you know, start scratching his head and he'd, he'd pull back like, where'd that hand come from? I find myself whenever I lean too close and my and my lips hit the microphone. I find my, <laughs> um, but with the mind, so to me, it's the simplest way is right. There's life lessons, but really, life lessons have all kind of uh, uh, they've kind of calcified and formed their own like almost like Galapagos islands like their own areas of genetic drift and bottleneck um like almost like little eddies edy 
you know, like magnetic eddies or in the river, they kind of create their own little offshoots, their own little pools. They've all kind of turned into their own like little pools, right? Their own branches. And they've kind of solidified and grown roots over the millennia. Catholicism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, J Judaism, uh, you know, Taoism, whatever, Zoroasterism, Scientology even, fuck it, whatever. And those are all kind of their belief systems, right? Maybe you're not that. Maybe you're into yoga. Maybe you're an atheist and you just believe in, you know, you do what feels right. Um, whatever it is. Maybe you don't have a set system. Okay, whatever. But they're all these kind of, again, if you were to boil them all down, you know, thou shall not, or, you know, if a man, you know, or, you know, some Confucius teaching. But if you were to just boil all of these down, just like we did with biology and, you know, what goes up must come down and the, the, the fucking fish and the lion and all that shit. If you were to just boil down all of human, all these religions, uh, these belief systems, the center, the, the center most, what am I looking the, the archetype, the hero's journey type thing is the golden rule. Now there's a lot of, you know, it's like, you can't believe in, I know a lot of religions have that, you know, you shouldn't believe in any other God or, you know, uh, it's, you know, don't be. You know, you're in the world, not of the world. Um, you know, life after death, blah, 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 blah. But what do they all really come down to? And this is a gross generalization, but I would say if you had to take the most middle ground answer for this, it's that the golden rule, do unto others as you would like to have done to yourself, right? You, you get out what you put in. The last line of the Beatles' last song. And in the end, the love you make is equal to the love you take, or and or it's the love you take is equal to the love you make, right? So that's an interesting. So if we can, and granted, this is all predicated upon that my splitting and categorization of reality is correct. That there's a physical, and then there's the the spirit. There's the corporeal and the conscious. There's the there's the there's the what, and then there's the witness. So this could all be like, it might all be predicated. You could create like this complex theorem of math, but if your basic addition is wrong, where you said one plus one is three, all of your PhD level studies are going to be based off of a flawed foundation. So this is all based on, is the foundation correct? But let's just take it and run with it. There seems to be an interesting mirroring of what goes around comes around. Do unto others as you would like to have done to yourself. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? It seems like we've taken that step just one step further, right? It's the same, it's the archetype, it's the trope, it's the dad's coming to the championship game. You know, mom and dad got back together just for this one night. They put their differences aside, right? And you get the girl and the girl leaves the pop, right? It kind of seems like we see that with the physical world and then the spiritual world is there's this mirror. They both do the what goes around comes around. And that seems to be the centerpiece of reality for for whatever reason. There doesn't need to be a better or worse. There doesn't need to be some religious drive or fervor behind it. It just seems upon observation that that is what it is for whatever reason. On a side note, when I was meditating, I'm smoking a little word. I remember at the end of it, I was like, oh, so that's the lesson of, that's that's what life is. What goes around comes around. That, that just seems to be the core of it. But then I began thinking, is this whole life, is this whole universe, this incarnation, are we here to learn that lesson? And it's not that that's the end all be all lesson for all of reality. 
it's that that was the purpose of this incarnation. So that no matter where you looked, whether it was playing a game of pool or throwing a ball up and down or being mean to someone and then feeling bad about it or being kind to someone and then having it come back to you, we're looking out into the through a telescope and seeing planets hitting each other. Is everything in this reality based upon equal and opposite reaction, force, counterforce? Everything is built on that so that we learn that, right? It's just like how the hero's journey can be dressed up with a million different stories. Is this whole thing, is this whole world, is it, is it just one college course, you know? When you finish a course in whatever, biology one, and you get an A in it and you finish it, that doesn't, you don't finish and then go, ah, now I'm finished with education. No, you, you're finished with that class. You should, you're still taking four of their classes this semester and you get like eight semesters of college. So the thing I thought when I was meditating that day in 2013 was, are we, is that the lesson of this universe? Equal and opposite reaction. And it's just, it's not, it's, it seems like it's the, it's the end. I just did it again, or I bumped and jumped back. It seems like it's this overarching, the golden rule. But of course it would seem like that because we're in a universe designed to teach us that lesson. I really do need it. I think I, I think I have a deviated septum. Yeah. I can see my nose. It's kind of crooked. Hmm. Interesting. Of course, it's going to seem like that's the golden rule because we're within this system that is apparently trying to teach us through example that this is the ruling, the fundamental system. My next thought is, is, is this universe just one lesson? Is it just one course? Huh, you got the lesson. Okay, and you know, you, 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 the book report's due on Monday. You did it Friday afternoon. Now you have the rest of the weekend to play. Some people fuck around and then they got to stay up Sunday night and do it. You know, is, may I be as, may I be so bold as to say I, I figured it out and now do I get to go play for the rest of the weekend? Did I figure it out and I get to just go run around until, until Monday comes, Monday being death. And there's some, beauty in that or some <laughs> poetry in that but not really jesus i've got a fucking inflated ego but is it just that and it's finished and if you don't figure it out you got to take the course again but now that it's finished do we die go into another multiverse with different laws of physics or maybe they don't even have physics it's something else who knows they have some other system it's not even math or maybe they don't even have systems Maybe it's incom incomparable to this reality. There's nothing to compare it to. So what Terrence McKenna says about um, DMT, no words can describe it because nothing from that reality exists in this reality and vice versa. So is this reality, do we just have one? And, and that's the thing is, and then we get to the next multiverse and there's another lesson to learn. And we just do this, maybe we're doing it forever. We're in training to be gods. We live through a hundred trillion lives and then we finally garner enough wisdom to become a deity. Who the fuck knows? I don't. Go buy this hoodie, support my podcast. But that being said, it makes sense then, right? That we find that, that golden rule even in thermonuclear weapons mutual assured destruction it all comes back if you don't fire your missile and no missile will be fired back at you if you do fire it it will be that's crazy so is that is that the underlying theme of all of reality i don't know it kind of seems like it 
right? Because you don't want something destabilizing like Project Pluto or, uh, you know, the Flying Crowbar, which is the same thing. We're getting off into the weeds now. Um, yeah, let's wrap this one up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Stay safe. Have a good weekend. And uh, thanks for being here.